this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand together as we open our service in song.
Well, welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are viewing through the internet. This is the second week in Advent. Advent, the anticipation of the coming of Christ. The Advent, which meant pretty much silence for 400 years before Christ came. Very few, if any, were expecting or anticipating his coming. And so they lived in the midst of the circumstances of their lives. As we live now on this side of the cross, on this side of the manger, in our circumstances of life. The offering will be taken through the offering boxes that you'll find at the end of the aisle, as well as they can be received digitally and through the mail. And we thank you for your support. This past week, we collected a mountain of toys for tots, as well as canned goods. We had a table set up in the driveway with large boxes, and all through the week, people drove through uh, depositing uh, those items. This is a particularly difficult time on nonprofits, not only churches, but the Salvation Army, which relies on a large part of their budget on the weeks prior to Christmas, uh, the ringing of the kettlebells. And with the malls being slow, all of this is having an effect uh, on all uh, nonprofits. So we appreciate your thinking about the church. We will be celebrating every Sunday uh, worship as we have been at nine o'clock and 10 o'clock. And on Christmas Eve, uh, we will be celebrating here in the sanctuary a seven o'clock Christmas Eve service. So you're all cordially invited, as well as to the study that happens uh, today at 5.30 here in the church as they're studying the book of First John. Our condolences go to Chancellor, uh, Chandler, who is our intern. Uh, his wife's dad passed away this week and would appreciate knowing your support and prayers. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come just in an Advent season, an event to fill us with hope. And at the same time, we live in a world under great stress. We recognize the fatigue of event after event over these eight or nine months, leaving us now in a window of uncertainty as to how all of this will turn out. But we're also reminded of the words of Job, that life is full of trouble. And this from the oldest book that we know of, reminding us of the challenge of living our lives. It certainly is not just from one success to another. There are obstacles and challenges, disappointments, there's good news and bad news, confusing news. And in the midst of all of it, you are present. We ask that you would remind us this morning of your presence and remind us of the hope that comes to us through Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So this is a rather uh, unusual, strange Advent season. 
with all of the obvious complications of pandemics and politics and economics and schools opening and closing and confusing messages from day to day. The whole world is in a type of lockdown on this, the second week of Advent. The reality though, if you go inside of yourself, what are you experiencing? If you're like me, it's conflict. Conflict in anxiety. How's this all going to turn out? What's going to happen to me, to my family? What will happen to the church? What will happen to the country, to the world? These are emotions that fill every one of these layers of anxiety and fear. So on the one hand, I have anxiety concern. They are very real. They show themselves in relationships, in checkbooks, in decisions that you have to make. And so Jesus never promised that this world would be taken away. As a matter of fact, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. And I think we can all say amen. On the other hand, we have hope, anticipation, whether it's as a child, the coming events of Christmas, or a more mature sense of hope because of what Christ has done, that in the end, all of these things are working for good. And so right now, I am torn between those two emotions of anxiety, of concern, and at the same time of hope and anticipation. And I'm stuck right in the middle. I would like to be able to say, at all times, I'm just filled with hope until I get that piece of news. And then I wonder, how is this going to work? How does all of this come together, especially as a Christian? Well, this is nothing new. I think Christians and the world understands this tension between anxiety and hope and joy. As a matter of fact, the scriptures are quite realistic about that tension. This time of year, as we remember, the words coming from the angels that in this day in the city of Bethlehem will be born a savior to you. He's Christ the Lord. Uh, those words almost slip off of our tongue, uh, almost more as a cliche than having significance uh, given the circumstances of life. Well, this is nothing new. As a matter of fact, in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 10, is the first proclamation. And it's mixed. To the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. In that one sentence is the two realities of emotion fear, and joy, good news. Now that pattern continues 
throughout the narrative. An angel appears to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And what does he say? Do not be afraid. Her husband to be, Joseph, in Matthew 1.30, is greeted with the same words. Do not be afraid. In this case, to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine hearing those words? Nothing like this has ever happened before. You're a young Jewish girl following the law, the guidelines of Judaism, remaining pure, waiting until marriage. And now an angel comes. Certainly, you have to shake your head. What is this? I've never seen an angel before. It speaks and says to me, don't be afraid. You're going to have a baby. What do you mean, don't be afraid? Do you know what the law says? I'm not married. The law requires that I be stoned to death or driven out of this village as a single mom destitute, homeless. Don't be afraid. Why? Joseph, why don't you just give her a letter of divorce and end this right now? Because this is going to get very complicated to the shepherds in the fields, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. On this day will be born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He'll be in a manger. Go and see. The baby's born. We've seen this iconic image a thousand times on Christmas cards. The manger. An attempt to bring the hope of that moment. From the cradle, the artist's rendering of bright light well, we know that Christ is the light of the world, and so we read into that and say, isn't that a beautiful thought? But what was the reality of that moment? This is a poor couple, nowhere to go, no room, being turned away to a small shed surrounded by some animals, and a baby is born. It looked nothing like this. To say nothing, a short time later, from a distant land would come wise men, the magi. They know enough to go to the emperor and ask Herod uh, about this child. He's concerned. They pick up his between the line message. Oh, this is very interesting. You're here to worship the new king. When you find him, come back to me and tell me where he is that I too might worship him. In those words, they recognized incredible danger. And so the scripture says that once they deposited their gifts, 
they went another way home, meaning that they understood they were in great danger, that the baby was in great danger. Perhaps they remembered Moses, who was freed from Egypt as all the people returned to the promised land, pursued by an army of Pharaoh. Perhaps the Magi feared their own pursuit. We have no record of what they were thinking. But if they went another route, they were aware of some danger. Did they look over their shoulder? Are we being followed? We don't know. But we do know this. It was only a short time later that Herod, who never wanted to worship this child, that Herod ordered the murder of the innocents, of every male child under the age of two. The terror of mothers, of fathers, as Roman soldiers descend on that little village to take the life of their children. It caused the family of Mary and Joseph and the little baby to run away. And where did they go? They fled to Egypt in hiding, afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary. I bring you good news of great joy. And now we're hiding. What is the future? Does God care about these circumstances? The moment in which I live. Tomorrow is December 7th, a day which goes down in infamy. Why? Many of you, all of us perhaps, our parents remember this day, December 7th. It was the attack on Pearl Harbor. A day that Roosevelt said will be forever remembered, a day of infamy. The electric shock that burst around the globe with the bombs, the dive bombers descending on Pearl Harbor. The leader of those of that raid was Mitsuo Fuchida. He's known as the man who led the bombing of Pearl Harbor. His name instantly became telegraphed around the world. As time would go by, books would be written about him. Movies, I bombed Pearl Harbor. Another movie, Torah, Torah, Torah. The words delivered by Fuchida, attack, attack, attack. He was in the lead plane, descending on the Pacific fleet. Within a very short matter of almost seeming minutes, the Japanese would lose 29 aircraft, but that was nothing compared to the U.S. Pacific Fleet that lost 2,403 lives. 
21 ships were destroyed, including almost every battleship of the Pacific Fleet. 188 aircraft were destroyed. Another 159 were damaged. When he returned safely from leading that attack, Fuchida's plane had 21 bullet holes in it. He was just 39 years old. The mechanic who looked at his plane as it landed found a frayed electric cable that dangled from the reconnaissance bomber's bay by a single thread. The mechanic said, if that simple thread <coughs> had been broken, his plane would have had no control and he would have instantly plunged to his death. The command would not have been given. Torah, Torah, Torah. Now, when Fuchida landed with the plane filled with bullet holes, the frayed line, he wasn't a spiritual man, he was a Buddhist, but just mildly practicing. How did he interpret that event? Well, just like you and I would, I was really lucky. Wow, the fates were with me. How fortunate. Well, it wasn't long after that he'd received such notoriety that in June of 1942, he was to lead the attack on Midway. And so fully prepared, but six days before, he had an attack of appendicitis. He was sent to the infirmary. He was forced to look on from the Japanese ship, the bridge, as he watched his team of pilots attack the USS Enterprise. The Enterprise fired its gun. and sunk all of the Japanese battleships, meaning that all of the planes that were flying overhead had nowhere to land. One of them struck the ship that Fuchida was watching all of this happen. He was blown from the bridge. Both of his ankles were broken. He was dragged from the smoldering debris and put aboard the U.S. Enterprise. Is now prisoner of war. He escaped. How lucky I am. His notoriety led him to a staff position as vice admiral with the vice admiral Kakatua near the island of Guam. When the Japanese lost the battle, 
the admiral gave the order to his entire staff, Sapuku, Sapuku, the samurai suicide. And so each officer with a sword was to plunge it into their belly, disembowel themselves, and die. Fuchida obeyed the law. But he missed the vital organs by two inches and survived. Now it was beyond how lucky I am. He started to ask himself, what does all this mean? Why am I still here? How did this happen? After Okinawa fell in 1945, Fuchida was ordered to Hiroshima. The day before the bomb was dropped, he was ordered to fly 500 miles away from Hiroshima. The next day, he heard that everyone he had had breakfast with the day before were destroyed in the bomb. The whole city was destroyed. He was asked and commanded to return to Hiroshima. He went with 12 men. They surveyed the destruction. Within 72 hours, one by one, the other 12 men showed the symptoms of radiation poisoning. They lost their appetites, their energy, their hair fell out. They died. Fuchida had no symptoms. He survived. Now the question was even more profound for him. Why? Why am I still here? Is there something else that's overseeing my life? The war ended. Fuchida was aboard the USS Missouri at the signing of the peace. Now the war is over. What do I do? He and his wife bought a small plot of land and he raised chickens. Two years after the ending of World War II, Fuchida received an invitation. It was sent by General MacArthur. He was to testify about war crimes during World War II. When he landed to give his testimony, he picked up a book. Now, while Fuchida was dropping his bombs on Pearl Harbor, another man, Jake DeShazar, was in the army in California doing KP, working in the kitchen when the news came, the attack on Pearl Harbor. It filled him with rage, revenge. He enlisted immediately 
into a volunteer secret mission, which would be led by Jimmy Doolittle. Doolittle would fly aircraft and bomb Tokyo simply to show you can't get away with this. He also knew that they didn't have enough gas to return. De Cesar was a bomber, bombardier, on one of those Doolittle planes. They dropped their bombs and then sought to escape. They ran out of gas, landed over Japan. He was taken captive, parachuted, and held by the Japanese as a prisoner of war. After almost 40 months of confinement, on the 25th month, De Shazar was given by another soldier the only Bible that they had. And the order of reading that Bible was first the officers and then tenure. It took 25 months before the Shazar was given the Bible. He read the Bible. His heart, his life changed. He said, I can't explain it. The, the sense of revenge, of hatred that I had disappeared. And it disappeared at the words of Jesus, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. As a result, he wrote a book. It was published after the war. It was called Vengeance to Forgiveness. It's now after the war. Mitsuko Fuchida is about to give testimony to war crimes. He lands in an airport, picks up a book, reads it, is amazed. And then he comes to the place, the same place that the Sejar came, the crucifixion of Christ. Forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And Fuchida became a Christian. After the war, Fuchida wanted to meet the Sejar, and they did meet. There was an instantaneous friendship, forgiveness. They embraced one another. They opened the Bible together. Their family became friends. As a result, Fuchida says, there was another day of infamy when my life was changed and I forgave. The headlines throughout the world, Pearl Harbor hero converts to Christianity. It's hard for us to imagine today how sensational those words were. The entire world knew Fuchida's name. And now, a man forgiven, embracing his enemy. Fuchida wrote a book from Pearl Harbor to Calvary, where he recounts the story. 
he became good friends with Billy Graham. And routinely was on various broadcasts and crusades with Graham. So here we are. We sing the songs like, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the little bitty babies in his hands. He's got you and me in his hands. Nothing that has happened in your life or mine is an accident. It's all part of God's plan. He wants us to see him in everything. But unfortunately, we don't see him in everything. As a matter of fact, uh, this year at the Rockefeller Center, like every other year, is the beautiful tree. It's different this year. You won't be able to see it unless you get a ticket. And then you're one of four people for five minutes. Keep moving, keep moving. It's not going to be the crowds of the past. But for some reason, that tree has to go up. Why? Well, when we see it, there is a sense of excitement, of hope, of purpose. Something is happening. It's not the same. We're not focused just on this pandemic. But more than that, this tree has stood uh, for decades at this time of year. A tree, alive, vital, filled with lights. Why? Well, as Christians, we know that Christ is the light of the world. And every time we see a Christmas tree, we think of Christ, the light that he brings into our life. The finale of Christmas at Rockefeller Center, what was the highlight every year? What is the tradition? The camera goes up the tree, showing the beautiful lights until it comes to the peak. And then the camera focuses on the star. So all Christmas trees have a star. But how many of us remember that that star is the star of Bethlehem? It's the star that started all of this. It's not just simply a beautiful display. It's for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. You and I have been given the gift of life. There is not a moment in your life that God is not involved. There is not a moment, a circumstance in your life or mine that God is not behind it, saying, do you see me in this? Do you see me in this? And we say, I don't see you. I, I'm, I'm hiding in Egypt. I saw children being killed. How are you in this? This life is filled with anxiety and fear. But it is also filled with the hope and the light of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And this world will bring peace. But the peace that the world brings is not the same as mine. Yes, it's Christmas tree lights.
That's the kind of peace the world gives. But those Christmas lights don't save anything. Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The peace that I give you is a peace beyond understanding. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for the new life that you give to us. We ask now that as we go from this place, you will remind us again of the hope that is ours because of Christ. We thank you in his name. Amen. Let us stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you. Be gracious to you. Because Jesus promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Go joyfully in the name of Christ. Amen.